It is 6 o'clock, and it is the first Thursday of the month, and that means it's time once again for the Post-Prison Education Program radio show. And we are joined here in the studios by the founder and uh, what president of uh, the Post-Prison Education Program, Ari Cohn. And Ari, you've brought a guest along. Um, I, yeah. How about you uh, introduce uh, your guest? So I thought uh, Kevin... Alan, uh, who's the one person I know that was in my life before the post-prison education program started, that has continuously been involved with post-prison since uh, 2005. In fact, I was thinking earlier today, when we started out in this little 500-square-foot office up on the second floor of the central building, Two people had plastic cards for security to get in the building, and he was the other one. So um, I thought he's also the guy who, who meeting him was literally what caused me to start the program, for which I will never forgive him. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and... Uh, The uh, so he's been here. I thought we'd talk about things that go back, predate the post prison education program, and then come right on up, following pretty much the Facebook posts that we put up the last two days about tonight's program and topics that we're going to talk about. And he's been there from the beginning, uh, or before the beginning, till. Now, all right. Pull so. your mic a little closer. Or pull, pull it up to you. Right there. Yeah, that'd be great. Right now. Yeah. All right. So you know, I um, we have this problem. So we're kind of as a nonprofit, we're caught in the mire of um, uh, of. Uh, uh, of mental illness and addiction and lack of funding and government making bad decisions and government not giving a DAMN, I can say, right? A damn, really. Um, I had Kevin read my T-shirt to me earlier. It's a James Baldwin quote. Um, and, uh, you know, they say government and funders will say one thing and then but then their actions prove otherwise and so um and i was thinking about so we use we use constant contact for listserv right and uh for quarterly newsletters and it's 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 disconcerting if, if to not be able to discuss important issues because people will look at the subject line and they'll if it's unpleasant They'll delete it, um, or and, and we can see this. We can we uh, we can see who opened the list the the email up, how many times they opened it, if they forwarded it, what time they opened it, um, or if they didn't open it. And um, our click rate is is super interesting to watch. So if you if we put out um, if I was to put out a newsletter about serious mental illness and the world's coming to an end and all these critical issues that, that we deal with, high rates of recidivism, the click rate right might be 15%. It would be really low. If we put out a, a, a newsletter to our listserv in the subject line is something like, thank you, one exclamation mark, thank you, two exclamation marks, thank you, three exclamation marks, the, the click rate will be almost 30%. And, and, and so, like, after a Seattle Foundation uh, Give Big event several years ago, we really saw that in a demonstrative way. We, it was like, that was the subject line, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it was the highest click rate we've ever had. The lowest click rate was when we were trying to have a discussion about mental illness and get people involved in, in the fact that we've criminalized mental illness. People don't want to hear it, you know. But the reality, in my mind, is uh, 
uh, these are issues we should we need to discuss, and, and they're impacting society and and families and children and parents and 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 everybody. But it's just uh, so I don't quite know how to 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 deal with that um, or to overcome that. And um, but tonight I want to talk. I think that sort of segues into some kinds of things that people don't want to talk about. So uh, Joe Jensen and I were talking, uh, and she's been on this show before. She's a member of the board. Of she's a member of the board. She's, okay. uh, she's uh, a, a, a huge supporter financially and otherwise morally and uh, in every other way. She's been to prison with us. And uh, um, and we were talking about funding issues, right? And uh, we actually had a long conversation about what, I, I mean, I don't even almost know how to, I told her this anecdote that I'm going to tell now. We put it up on Facebook. So, um, but it goes, it, it, and it's along the lines of what we were just talking about. If I, if we send out a listserv that's talking about wine, apple pie, mothers, orgasms, being in Yosemite, hiking the John Muir Trail, Arabian horses, Belgian draft horses, you know, positive things, everybody wants to get involved. Uh, but if we want to talk about government's clear undeniable attitude or thinking process that prisoners are some form of subhuman. Nobody wants to hear the, have the conversation, but we're going to try to have it tonight. So, um, I, the, when it, and this is what, this is the anecdote I told Joe the other day, we were, I went to prison in 1995 and I started out in the, in the United States penitentiary USP Atlanta, which is a, uh, uncool place. Uh, DOC in Washington has nothing like the Atlanta Penitentiary, not even close. Um, and uh, I was about to ship out and uh, to be shipped out and, and a guy saw my name on this list that, that showed people who were going to ship out that night, which means they're going to come to your cell and cuff you out and strip you and chain you and put you on the bus and take you somewhere. And he saw that I was going to be shipped to Fort Dix, uh, FCI Fort Dix in New Jersey. And he said, I, I've got something I want to show you, right? And uh, so we were just out for about an hour before they locked down again. And he went over to his cell and he came out with two or three inches of, of legal papers and it turned out he had just been kicked out of Fort Dix for filing grievances against the Bureau of Prisons for unsafe water, uh, deadly unsafe water in that, in that prison. Uh, and and uh, so he was back at USP waiting to be re redesignated to a different prison. And he showed me this letter that I posted on Facebook uh, earlier. I think it's on my page. And... Uh, and I think it's on the program's page also. It's If you go down, uh, I'm looking now. Um, so it's on the program's page, not my page. But you'll see a letter from the Environmental Protection Agency, right? And it's uh, one that I, it's basically the one he showed me and that I got through Freedom of Information. There it is, yeah. Uh, uh, later on uh, once I got to Fort Dix and uh, uh, I'm going to quit looking at my phone and just go by go by memory so I know it so anyway th the letter basically showed that um, the federal government was saying that the water quality at Fort Dix was not just bad it was dangerous so the worst the worst uh, or the, the 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 worst poison on earth is mercury. I don't know if that's you know the worst. It's just the most toxic poison on earth. You can Google it, read about it. And this letter from the federal government showed that 
uh, the content of mercury in the water that 4,400 prisoners were bathing in, brushing their teeth in, having their spaghetti cooked in, was 165 times the maximum contaminant level allowed by law. 165 times. It actually showed, um, it shows this letter, shows the MCL, and, and then it shows the actual test result. And it was something like 0 0.330 divided by 0 0.002 um, gets, uh, it goes like 165 times. So the, the desired level on mercury would be none, right? And then, then you jump up to the maximum contaminant level, and then this was 165 times higher than that. And so when I got to Fort Dix 14 hours later in, in, uh, in chains and black box, uh, then uh, I came, came out off the bus into a receiving cage, and I saw a guard uh, leaning on a water cooler and um, he had bottled water in his hand, and he was leaning on a water cooler that had a huge filter on it. And so I, I, my first thought was that guy back at the Atlanta Penitentiary was right, you know, because this guy wouldn't be paying for bottled water or drinking bottled water instead of using this water cooler, which had this huge filter on it, unless something was terribly wrong. And pretty quickly I used uh, the defense law firm that I had hired to do my appeal to get the same letter uh, from from the EPA that I'd been shown in the Atlanta Penitentiary, and it's what we're talking about now. And, and I got it. And so I, once I got it, I wanted to make copies of it, right? And I worked for education. I was a GED tutor. And I went to this lady. Um, I should have asked you, I don't want to offend anybody, and especially Catholic friends, but getting to, for a prisoner to get access to a copy machine in a federal prison would be like somebody trying to get in the Virgin Mary's panties. It's just like impossible, or presumably so. <laughs> it's like, so, but I went to this teacher that I worked for, showed her the letter, and told her I wanted to make copies. And when she saw the letter, she said, i never forget it, she said, she said, now I know why so many of my friends have had miscarriages, and now I know why the, this Fort Dix area has the highest miscarriage rate in the, in the entire United States. And that was because of the high content, not only of, of mercury, but also beryllium and thallium and, and so on. And so she, she let me into the room where the copier was, and I ran 500 copies. And then at recall for lunch, where you go back from where you work, back to your housing unit before being released to a dining hall to eat, I handed five or ten copies of that letter to everybody that I passed that I knew. And I'm, a, I'm just going to tell you, I'm a, a, like, at heart, I'm like this kind of naive, dumb country boy from Central Florida who'd rather be on horses and cleaning stalls than anything else. And, and so, like, knowing how prisons work and what causes riots, I'm, like, clueless. In fact, then I came up in a fairly wealthy Central Florida super conservative family that believed in the Department of Justice, believed in government. And, uh, and uh, so, I, uh, anyway, so we, we were released to lunch, and, and I go to lunch, and I come back, and the one thing I already knew was that cops, guards, and prisoners don't stand together. You know, that's not a good thing for the guards to be seen standing with prisoners, and it's surely not a good thing for prisoners to be seen standing, having conversations with guards. But I walk back into the housing unit, and there's groups of 20, 30 guys, cops and guards, and, stu and prisoners all together, and they're staring at the walls. And I'm like, what in the heck is going on? And then I, people had uh, toothpasted this letter up on the walls throughout the housing unit, and people started to panic. And uh, 
we're already 15 minutes into the show, so I got a TMI and this to death. I got to cut it down. But uh, the what happened that day was uh, uh, people went to, to the pay phones and they're calling their spouses and their lawyers, and there were a lot of people uh, of. From, from South America in this particular prison. And, and so they're calling their embassies. And, uh, and there might have been 30, 40 guys at each payphone. And they're, they're frantic to get in touch with loved ones and lawyers. And um, the Bureau of Prisons, in its infinite wisdom, um, called work call and nobody went. Literally, because if you're, you're you're desperate to talk to a loved one about this letter and what it says and what it means in your life, and you've been standing in line for however long, and you and you don't want to lose your place, and you don't want to go to work having not talked to whoever you're trying to reach. So, and and the monitors back in the control rooms, they're listening to these conversations, so they know what this letter says, and they know what's being said on the phone calls, and when nobody goes to work, call. Then they shut the phones down, and there was a riot. And, and literally, the guards fled the prison. Literally, they fled the prison. And, so this, and this was caused by this dumb country boy from Central Florida, me, right? And, you know, when, when, when count time comes, that's going to happen. If God dies, count's going to happen. And so the Ninja Turtles come back into the prison around three, and they take control, and everybody's locked down. And um, and then um, people start going to the law library and trying to figure out what happened. And a guy from South America, uh, his embassy found out what had happened. So Boeing. Uh, and it's interesting for me to be living in Seattle now when when this all evolved around a Boeing accident. So Boeing had the nuclear missiles at the time. And very close to Fort Dix was a BOMARC, B-O-M-A-R-C, missile base with 10 or 12 armed nuclear missiles. And this was not long after World War II, and, and we don't really know what we're doing with radiation and beryllium and mercury and uranium. And one of those nuclear missiles caught on fire in the silo. And people poured, if I remember right, you can Google Bomark action. It's a super became a super fun fight. So you could Google Bomark, Ford Dix, uh, super fun EPA site or something, and you can see pictures of the missiles and you can see the silos and and uh, they poured t- ten twenty thousand gallons an hour of water over this nuclear warhead. And all of that nuclear waste went down into the aquifers. And that's what happened. And that stuff, I think, has a 10,000-year shelf life. So it, it's, it's there forever. And it's in the water there today in the largest prison in the United States of America, Fort Dix. And so we found out, we started to get the story. You know, prisoners writing their embassies and their lawyers, and the story started to come into prisoners, and then they would, would be shared in the law library. And And what we found out was that when this nuclear accident happened uh, with the Bomark site, the Department of Defense closed what had been a military base down. They closed it down and uh, because soldiers are human beings, right? Which they obviously are. You know, my dad was, my uncles were, my mother just got a, a congressional gold medal for being a pilot in the Air Force in World War II patrolling the, the coast, which was super cool. And, um, but soldiers are human beings. It, and that had been like a boot camp location. So when, they, when this nuclear accident happened, they closed it down. And it stayed closed for quite a while. And then the Bureau of Prisons needed a prison. And it was, so they gave Fort Dix to the Bureau of Prisons because it was okay to put prisoners there because prisoners aren't human. Kevin and I have this friend, uh, Kim Mays, and, and Kim got, years ago, there was a, a woman ranting and raving in the News Tribune 
about bigger prisons, longer sentences, and Kim was fiery mad, and she wanted help writing a, an op-ed or something. And I'm just, I wanted to, I was teasing her a little bit, but I, I was like, you know, what are you mad about? You're not even a human being. You're subhuman. You're a former prisoner. You know, get over it, you know. And, and, and then she really got mad, and then we wrote an op-ed, and the News Tribune published it. And so, but that was the deal. That was a huge eye-opening experience for me, and it really let me know how federal government and, 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 and decision makers think about prisoners and former prisoners. And this carries over to funding. It's like, it's, so it's, if, just think about it. It's okay to have prisoners there with brushing their teeth in this water washing their face, taking showers, having their spaghetti cooked in it. But it's not okay for soldiers to be there. And then and that was when I really, I, like 1996, realized that in the eyes of government, prisoners aren't people. And that's what makes it be okay for the Washington State Legislature and the Federal Bureau of Prisons and the United States Congress to not fund programs, to not deal with people who are mentally ill, to not provide housing. To not, 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 not. All these things that people need who are former prisoners and, and, and prisoners to not provide those things because this this horrible us versus them or or, or whatever you want to call it thing has, has happened. And in the public's eye, it's been decided that 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 prisoners just aren't people. You know, they're and, and so they've been locked away in cages and they're just treated completely differently. So, you know, you won't find a legislator or somebody in Congress uh, who would ever be willing to have their children be treated the way prisoners and current, you know, former prisoners are treated. Uh, you won't find people in Olympia that want for prisoners and former prisoners and their families and kids the same thing they want for their loved ones. And, and then, and at least if they fake like they care, they don't act on it. So, so that was just like, um, and I'm just going to, if anybody wants this letter and isn't on Facebook, just write to me, re.cone at postprisonedu.org. If, uh, if anybody's got questions on this, write to questions at postprisonedu.org, and we'll send you uh, information. The, you know, the, 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 the next step in, in this scenario about how prisoners and, and former prisoners are treated. And, and, and a big part of my education um, what is at Fort Dix, there was a guard. His name is Rodney D. Champlain. Uh, and if you look on, the, again, on the, the post about the show on the program's Facebook page or my Facebook page, you'll see these you'll see these two GQ articles, right? And the one that came out in 97, the first one came out in 96, but the one that came out in 97 talks about Rodney D. Champlain. So, but, so what, what happened in just carrying this a little bit forward and trying to watch the clock, which is just disappearing at a crazy rate, um, what happened was um, in a guy was back in federal prison at the Oklahoma City Transfer Center just on a parole violation. And Mike, you'll remember this, and Kevin and I were talking about it earlier. We brought this guy's brother in, who's a lawyer in Salt Lake City, Jesse Trinidad, to town hall a couple of years ago. And, um, but this guy's back on a parole violation. Nothing, his, most li his greatest liability on the parole violation was three months locked up. And the feds got it in their head that he might have somehow been involved with what turned out to be Timothy McVeigh's dynamiting of the federal building in Oklahoma City. And so they, they went into his cell in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the Bureau of Prisons, Oklahoma City Transfer Center. And from these two GQ articles, uh, and, and you can maybe come up with it, Google Kenneth Trinidu. Um, it, it reads like uh, they interrogated him and 
and basically tortured him, and in the last result, they beat him to death with a fire extinguisher. And, and, and then they tried to claim it to be suicide, right? And, and so the, the warden of that transfer center was on vacation that, the night of that murder. Uh, the associate warden and everybody else from there on down, and then finally all the way up to Bureau of Prisons headquarters, they lied. They lied and they lied and they lied and they lied for years and, and tried to claim it was a suicide. But the deal was when they did the autopsy and when they put luminol in this cell, it lit up like a Christmas tree, which showed that there was blood on the ceilings, the floors, the walls. Uh, the damage to his body was extraordinary, and it clearly wasn't suicide. So the Bureau of Prisons murdered a guy, a prisoner, and, and then they protected the murderers, and they're protected to this day. So what happened and how it related to me was that night, when that murder took place, everybody was transferred. They either retired them or transferred them. Yeah. So Rodney D. Champlain, who was one of the United States Department of Justice employees in that cell that night when, 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 when Kenny Trinidad was beaten to death, uh, was transferred to Fort Dix. And he and I went round and round and round and round. And, and, and so if I walked into the dining hall with a keypaw on, he would try to make me take it off, which I wasn't going to do. And, uh, uh, and, or, and, and after that riot, they, they, they wanted to jack my security level up so they could transfer me to a higher security prison. So then, um, so they would falsify charges. So like they charged me with being out of bounds in a building I'd never been in disobeying an order from a guard I never talked to, had never seen, didn't know his name, had no interactions with. And finally, Ray D. Champlain planted scissors in my, in my locker that God couldn't have gotten into the prison, right? And then they did a shakedown and found the scissors they had planted. And at that point, I was on a bus to Ferriton, to the next prison and straight into the hole. But I was sitting several prisons after that. I'm at Allenwood, right? And somebody walked over and handed me this magazine. Somebody who knew me at the prison at Fort Dix and knew my history with D. Champlain walked over and handed me this GQ. And, and I was in the law library at, at an IBM Selectric II. They were kind of weird devices. They're in the Smithsonian <laughs> now, right? If, and, and, but you could type on them, just like a computer keyboard, but, but they made lots of noise. And, but they put ink and letters actually on white paper. It was kind of cool. And uh, uh, you're old enough to remember that. Cut it out. <laughs> so, 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 so I sat back and I was like horrified. And, and I asked and I found it and, I, and I'm like, my God, I've been tangling with a guy who murdered a prisoner and got away with it. And, he, and, and, and then I was asking myself, if I had known that this guy, Rodney D. Champlain, had successfully murdered a prisoner, would I have been brave enough to, to interact with him as I did during my whole time at Fort Dix? And I think I know the answer. I hope I know the answer. But, but, but it's, a, it's a sort of a lingering question, you know. Like, uh, but the whole, th the whole thing was, it all goes back to, like, how prisoners are looked at and how, the, and how they're treated and, and, um, and what level of commitment People who are working at foundations, who are in the legislature, um, bring to, to finding solutions that are needed. And, you know, can I tell the story about when you and I met? It, 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 uh, we were at, you were at that nonprofit event in 2005, and it, that sort of welcoming home party uh, that Leah Zengage did. And, it, right before we went to lunch at, at Julia, breakfast at Julia's. You're talking about the embarrassing moment I met you. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Do you even do you even remember that? It's for you right here. Huh? So. <laughs> yeah, that that was really good. You go ahead and talk about it, but I just want to share a few things about what I remember. Um, I was at a party coming out of prison. Imagine that a party that actually invited you back to the community, and Ari was there, and I think he was just trying to figure out 
how to get involved to help other prisoners because he'd been there himself. And there was something I said that stuck to him, and uh, he invited me out for breakfast. And he didn't tell you the rest from there. Well, what uh, Kevin told me the story that day, he was coming out of prison as his brother went back in, and they had been doing that for 20 years. And, and he told me what was behind that. He'd actually, the first time Kevin was locked up was before the Department of Corrections existed. So we've Googled pictures of this. It's dilapidated now, but when the prisons were under DSHS. So this is pre-1982 is when Kevin went, first went to prison. And uh, uh, we went on and... Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about, I mean, rather than talk about Kevin individually, but, you know, what puts people in prison, in, in, and you please add to this, is, is mental illness, addiction, co-occurring disorders, poverty, their parents almost always hooking them into addiction. And racism. And, and, and racism. It's just like, it's just, that's, but people, decision makers and funders want to treat prisoners as though, as adults, they wake up in the morning and decide in, in, they, that they want to go out and do some malicious act just to be hateful or whatever. And that's just not the reality. I've, I, don't, I don't think I can think of any person that, that the post-prison education program has worked with in the last 15 years, and, and there's thousands, thousands, literally. The last, the, the University of Washington audit that was done in 2016 looked at our work with 1,746 people. But those, those, nobody in that group that has drugs and addiction in their life wasn't introduced to drugs at a really early age, usually by their parents. I have yet to meet a woman or female that's a prisoner or former prisoner who hasn't subject been subject to every kind of trauma and abuse, sexual abuse to battering, period. So, like, poverty, mental illness, addiction, um, and, be, and and I think the worst thing is being hooked into addiction. You're 6, 8, 10 years old, and your mother and your dad are, are, are introducing you to meth and crack and heroin. And it, it, at that point, you can, I forgot what, what this word I want to use, I can say it or not. I, I hate the SEC. But it's like uh, a, a, and then there's two S's after that. Can I say that? Dumbass. <laughs> All right. So, so, so you, you can kiss your ass goodbye if you're a six, eight year old, 10, 10 year old kid, and your dad or your mom introduces you to drugs, you're addicted from that point forward. And you can literally kiss your ass and your future goodbye. And those are the people that we've locked up. And those are the people that society ha has chosen to hate, right? Uh, and wrongly so. And so you, you it, it, I'm not even, I'm like fumbling because it's just, it's, it's almost impossible to describe. Uh, well, let me put something in yeah, there. Yeah, please right. do. Um, Ari talks about this, this thing that happens to younger people. Well, conversely, here I am studying chemical dependency. And you know the number one thing we discuss is education. You know, the strange thing about it is while people were suffering because they were being treated wrongly and assaulted, um, at that same age is where we stress education about drug use has to start. They find that at the ages of four to six years old, the education has to start to prevent drug usage. And, and you can just see where the damage is done there, I mean, just say you do without the education and even the usage starts at an early age. But if you actually add the drugs to it, then you can imagine what the trauma and damage is. And the residual is, is look at the recidivism rate all throughout the U.S. You know, I, I, this is the most discombobulated radio show we've had yet because my mind's just all over the place trying to explain something really important, which is people's attitude 
about prisoners and former prisoners and who the public thinks prisoners and former prisoners are and why they think that and how wrong they are. And, and you know, there's like, so, so there's things that I think in the last 15, 16 years, um, well, actually going back to when I went to prison, so starting in 95, the things that really stick out in my mind uh, are being at Fort Dix and discovering this letter from the EPA and, and realizing that it's okay for the United States government, the U.S. Department of Justice, Congress, um, that, that prisoners are, are, are subjected or drinking or, 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 or living with this water. And then, and then uh, the whole, and then realizing that employees of the Department of Justice murdered a prisoner and then covered it up. That was that's staggering with me. And then that I, and I mean, I dealt personally with, with Rodney D. Champlain. I mean, I mean, he was in my face and I was in his face because I was too stupid to, to not be in his face. I mean, I filed grievances and did lawsuits and they're falsifying charges and then I get booted to another prison, higher security and put in the hole. But um, another thing, jumping way past it that always will stick in my mind was at the Washington State Legislature before Debbie Regala retired um, we were in a hearing about housing and and it was actually it was like a it was a legislative meeting and I think Debbie was one of the co-chairs of the meeting but it wasn't a formal legislative hearing and the result that was going to come out of that meeting, there were 40, 50 people uh, in that meeting room with the legislature, was way less than people needed. You know, way less money uh, for, for prisoners, former prisoners, for, for their families. And I remember Debbie Regalis, you know, she always said everything you wanted to hear, but this one time time when it was clear the result was going to be way too little, way too late. She talked to me, she said to me something about taking incremental steps. And I really want, I, I, it, it, that's like at least 10 years, I mean, it's, it's a decade ago, right? And I, I really wanted to, to say to her, people are dying, you goddamn blah, 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 right? It's not okay to take incremental steps when people are dying, but it was okay with her. So when you talk about level of commitment, or Jeannie Darnell telling Eldon Vale and, and uh, Roger Goodman and I, uh, the political will's not there. When you talk about level of commitment, um, it it all goes back to to how people look at prisoners and former prisoners, and what's you know it's so the, those are, and then obviously. You know, meeting Kevin was like life changing for me. I'm like white guy, privileged family. I had just finished five years at prison, but I'd also just finished four years at the University of Washington and four honor societies. And um, and and you know, I had no problems with reentry. I flew I flew from North Carolina out here. My brother's house in Florida, actually, on a, you know on Delta Airlines, checked into a hotel, spent a month in a hotel, figuring out what part of the town I wanted to live. I had no problems with reentry, and then I and, and I had a wonderful time at the University of Washington. And then a, a graduate professor told me that that I should go to this event where I met Kevin, right? Uh, and then I end up at Julia's Kitchen in August. Of, 2005 having breakfast with an ex-con having breakfast with an <laughs> with, with a former prisoner <laughs> right and and, and 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 listening to to you know him talk about mental illness and addiction and 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 this whole year 20 year history of of you know coming out recidivating coming out recidivating coming out recidivating and society having no answer for it that was life-changing for and I, I actually, had, I had taken, I'd done LSAT, I had taken, taken LSAT, I was applying to law schools, I had um, graduated UW, I was, uh, I had actually flown to three law schools uh, for interviews, and, 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 I, and I dropped it all, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, 
decided to start the post-prison education program, which truly proves I'm out of my mind. And, and uh, so, so there's these, these uh, like, earth-shaking events in my life since I went to prison, and, and they all evolve around um, they really all evolve around funding, but they, which all goes back to what people, um, how decision makers view prisoners and former prisoners. It's, so it's like society views former prisoners and funders, foundations, legislators, is some subhuman lesser thing. It just carries over like, you know, Gates Foundation. It's like, uh, I mean, their Northwest Programs has a policy. Last time I talked to them, they had a policy that Ken Thompson and them made really clear um, that uh, not helping adult former prisoners. They want to help kids because that's politically safe. But, uh, you know, so they're not putting, they're not putting the value on prisoners and former prisoners that I've seen and that everybody who's been around me the last 15 years has seen. So it's like with this group of people who could save lives, prisoners are seen to be like super low value, um, something despicable, something to hate, whatever. And then there's a group of us over here that take the time to meet people you know, be part of their lives, meet them, meet their kids, uh, be in prison with them, be in their homes, get them on campuses. And, and, and we see high value, you know. Um, and it's those, the conflict between those two things that's costing, you know, 5,000 people to commit suicide a year nationally, 70 to commit suicide from overdose or, or die from suicide or overdose in Washington State more than half of people to go back to prisons unnecessarily um, during their lifetime with new felony convictions. It's like there's all this hell. It's like a nuclear conflagration or something. I don't even know. I mean, would you You want to talk about it? You probably don't. I, if I was you, I wouldn't. It's, but, Are you going to give me a second to talk? Well, I want you to talk. You know, <laughs> no. I mean, well, um, talk about is, your last 15 no, years. You I can talk that? about that, but first... I would like to talk about something that I'm learning about in college. Media's impact on the human mind. All too often, we see everyday TV shows, the FBI, the CSI, et cetera, et cetera. And what they do is they always show animalistic behavior from a human being. And what we mean by animalistic is it goes so antisocial that we can't really stomach it. Now, that's the image that seems to come across when people think about prisoners. The unfortunate part about it is that's a very small percentage. And because of that image, the rest of us get treated in a, in a very violent way that goes against the violence that got them there. Now, you take, for instance, myself. I have no violence. I have so many drug charges, I can't count them. And yet and so because of the effort of someone that understood me, like sitting down to a cup of coffee and having breakfast, my life turned around. Now, I still went back and forth into prisons, don't get me wrong, but I felt like I was a person. I felt like I had some value. And it was all because someone took some time with me and, and let me know there's another prisoner out here. You're not, you're not walking around with numbers on the front of your face telling everybody you're a prisoner. And what I learned from that is I, I, I began to have value to my life, and I, I was determined to do something. Sure, I had been to college before, almost, well, almost before I went to, went to prison, but I had no focus. And only recently am I gaining that focus because I myself am bipolar, and I have a substance use disorder. The two together add up to less than a 15% chance of ever staying clean. With that statistic, it seems that prisons are made off of those statistics to incarcerate people. 
after all of these times in and out of prison. I came out, stayed out for four or five years, and was in jail probably over 40 times. I'm in mental health treatment the entire time. And despite all that, do you think I had a case, case uh, manager come see me in jail? No, but they would fill me full of drugs, but they'd never counsel me. And what actually happened was I came out, and believe it or not, it was Ari right there. Because we had known each other from basically his start in the business and watched my track record. And he kept seeing me go back and forth, back and forth. And it was just when he finally said, look, there's a couch in the office. Stop in and see me when you can. And that's when it began to change for me a little bit at a time. And uh, from being able to come in that office, no matter what condition I was in, that's where I began to feel some compassion. I felt someone cared. And when I learned that he was basically fighting DOC, um, that kind of fueled the fire. <laughs> we joined into it, and we've been at it ever since. Um, and now um, I'm maybe not as active in the program, but it's in me. It's in my blood, and uh, you know I'm determined. I, I have recently uh, found an end to tormenting myself. Um, I, I finally got my meds right. I, I get counseling a couple times a month. I have a whole community of support. You know, it was well back into the 80s. Um, or, you know, yeah, well back in the 80s when I met a person who said, it takes a host of people around every person coming out of prison to help them make it straight in the community. And I truly believe that. It's only recently that I have like eight to ten people who keep their eyes on me that I can call almost 24 hours a day. Now, it seems like I might be a little weak, but when you have the conditions that I'm dealing with, I have to, I have to humbly admit I need it. And uh, as a result of it, um, I'm studying in college. I have a year left to go. Um, I carry a little over a 3.97 GPA. I'm in the honor society. <laughs> <laughs> and Ari gets some reward for that. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, he's a large part of it. He, he told me this story about going to school and, and, and how you have to treat it like a job. And uh, it was about a year ago he offered to get me back in school. And uh, I got in school the, the first quarter, and it was like two months before I got any financial aid, so I was really suffering. And I haven't looked back ever since. I've been able to treat it like a full-time job because I'm properly funded. Good word, properly funded. And, and I'm able to have an apartment for the first time in probably over 15 or 20 years. I even have a job, I mean, I, first of all, couldn't get up through a background check. And then second, there was probably not enough money to get paid to make it so I could survive. Now I have a good paying job. I volunteer at treatment centers and I work with the very people I'm like. And, you know, I was at a, a group this morning. I co-facilitate a men's group of recovering addicts. And uh, most of them have more time sober than I do. But they were so delighted to hear my story and to know that there was some hope that you could come from any background and still make it. And believe me, most of the people in that room come from far worse backgrounds than I do. But I see them working through it and it gives me hope. And at the same time, they see me working through it and it gives them hope. And that's kind of the way the post-prison um, education program works. We give one another hope. There's, there's those few of us who have gone through it, tackled all the barriers, and now we're on our way. We have healthy boundaries, we have determination, we have focus, and we get to sit in on radio stations and try to make the program look good. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I've stolen the light from Ari a little while, and, and I must say, I've learned that I deserve that light. Um, 
No, crying's not loud, sorry. Then I shouldn't have been on this show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what comes with recovery, you know. Uh, emotions begin to show again. And, you know, from all the suffering that I put myself through and, and some of the rejection I found from working with people trying to get over my problems, that the emotions are coming back. And what I find is that I have a whole lot of pain. Um, and, and as I heal, just like a sore, it scratch, it itches. And the way I itch it is I shed tears. And... Uh, you know, I learned that that was okay to do because that's human. Unlike the way I was treated so many years in the prisons. And uh, it just lets me know that there is a process that, that moves us from, from prison to life. And it's called being treated as a human. And uh, I don't think... That's what they, they don't serve that up in work release. They don't serve that up when you go see your parole officer. I remember going to see um, my, my parole officer, my CCO, my community correction officer. And I would even tell him, look, I'm going to be dirty. And he gave me no reward for being honest. He just slapped me in the, in the jail and faced 30 more days. And when I'd come out of those 30 more days, he wouldn't send me to the treatment program. He would say, get back on the streets. No money, no place to stay. The clothes on my back. And if it wasn't for a loving friend, I don't know where I'd be right now. So well, the point of my story is it takes so much support. It takes a change in the image of yourself, a rise in self-esteem, a focus, some income, somebody that reaches out to you before you can reach to them, and determination to see you all the way through. Ari talks about 15 years. I just got my first year clean in 15 years. You know, I love PBS Frontline. I think it's amazing. And quite a few years ago, they did a story on prisons, but people suffering mental illness in prisons. And, and I think it was called The Asylum. And it was based on a prison in Ohio. And then they uh, followed that up with another frontline story that I think was called the incarcerated and it dealt with it dealt with um, the high percentage of prisoners who suffer mental illness and how fast they recidivated and caught new cases after release and if the, the introduction of um, to the PBS Frontline piece that I think, again, was called Incarcerated, um, had some horrible data in it. it, it was, and it was basically like 600,000 people release nationally a year, and 360,000 of them go back very quickly, and more than half of them are suffering mental illness, and they go back more quickly than anybody else. It was just a super sad, really well done story. And I put it up on the post prison education program's Facebook page, right? And just to show you the level of hate in this country, which is sickening. Um, I mean, I have, I've got my personal Gmail tied to the program's Facebook page because it's, so, so if somebody posts on that page, I instantly get an email and I pay attention to it because Haters have taught me I have to. And, and uh, I, so if it's 3 in the morning, I, I sleep with a cell phone on my bed because I'm not going to allow some just irresponsible, inexpressibly horrible post to, to, to stay on the 
post prison education programs Facebook page for more than a second or two. And but so we put this story up about the the frontline story, and um and and and, and it's talking about mental illness and recidivism, right, and the link between the two. And some guy, you know, you can click on somebody's name and see where they're from. So you, you can, and, and, and so some guy back in Kentucky, for real, posted this horrible uh, comment that he had a solution for the high recidivism rates of people suffering mental illness, and it was to shoot them. And then, and and, and for real, that that that's the way people and. So many people in this country are thinking right now. It's, it's, I, I don't even know how. I don't even know how to think about it, talk about it. I, you know, it's unbelievable. And they don't uh, want their tax money to go there. No, it's just like, <laughs> and, 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 and so I deleted that comment, right? And I blocked that guy from the page. And then a guy who worked for the prison system in California, who who may have been related to him, because he picked up the post, and. It was almost like a, hey, Uncle Bob, I got a, I got a, a better suggestion than that. Uh, and, and it was to kill multiple former prisoners suffering mental illness with one bullet. So you line them up, right? Don't kill one at a time. You can get three with one bullet. So then I deleted that guy and blocked him, right? But that's the level of hate in this country. And it's... Hmm. And it's, it's, it's horrible. And we can't get past that. I don't think you can take the people that support Donald Trump and ever educate them or change them. Uh, but we should be able to educate and change the Debbie Regalas and the Jeannie Darnells and the Tim Ormsby's and, and, and the Jay Inslee's and the Sonia Hallam's um, in the Washington State Legislature and people at foundations. To, to recognize the high value of, of prisoners and former prisoners, to get past their ignorance, to somehow find the political will that Jeannie Darnielle told Eldon Vale and Roger Goodman and I doesn't exist in the Washington State Legislature, and, and fund the solutions. So it's just like, um, it's, uh, I mean, the, the bottom line, going back to the beginning of this hour, is prisoners are people, and they have kids, um, and they have moms and dads, and they are moms and dads, and they have, you know, and, and they they have proven themselves in my last 15 years to be super high value, and and uh, and, and deserving of way more than this. God be damn worthless, God forsaken state is, is is delivering. And I'm through. You gotta do the last two minutes. You two, one um, of you do. You got two. Yeah, I you know, Ari talks about the financial aspect and I'm sure he talks about the personal aspect. But attitudes, as he was saying, is the main issue. The attitude not only needs to change from the person who's previously incarcerated. But it needs to change in society. If you can't reach out your dollar, then reach out yourself. Try to find something besides the ignorance that cultivates this unreasonable treatment of people who are part of your neighborhood. And quickly, how can people find out more about uh, the work of the post-prison education program? Well, I mean... If anybody wants specific information about what we discussed tonight, send an email to questions at postprisonedu.org. I've got 70,000 email in my inbox. Real number, please don't send me an email. But if you, but if you want to, you can. It's re.cone at postprisonedu.org, and we'll do our best to respond. Um, website is, is postprisonedu.org. Uh, the Facebook page, just go to Facebook, search Post Prison Education Program, uh, and it's 7 o'clock. All right. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Right. <laughs> All Thank right. you, Mike. Thanks. Thanks for your time, Mike.